Hi everyone, uh, we are with Lara Aronian, the director of the Women's Resource Center in Yerevan. Uh, Lara, thank you very much for taking time uh, to, to sit down with us. I um, wanted to ask you a few questions. Uh, first, to start off with, can you tell us about the path that led you to move uh, from Canada to Yerevan uh, and become an activist for women's rights? Mm -hmm. uh, I used to come before, before my move, my final move, I used to come as a volunteer with uh, Land and Culture. Uh, which is based in, based in France and the United States, and uh, I wanted something to bring me to Armenia, but not as a as a tourist. So I searched and I found this organization, which was giving me the chance to stay in a remote area in the villages because I didn't want to stay in, in uh, Yerevan specifically. So uh, I, I, at that time I just got married and we said it's a good opportunity to have our, our honeymoon here. <laughs> 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 So we took the next trip for the next summer, it was in 98, summer of 98. Um, and we came and we stayed in Nagarapa, in a small village in Karindak for a month, uh, renovating, helping with the renovation of the church. And it was amazing. This was my, actually it was my second experience in Armenia. I came before in 85, as uh, through a school project where, where they used to do exchanges. Uh, with Soviet army at that time and Lebanese schools when I used to live in Armenia and I stayed also for two months at that time but I was like 13 and I didn't remember a lot and uh, in 98 it was like very decisive decisive for me because uh, I had the chance to live immediately with villagers with local Armenians to share whatever they're sharing every day and uh, I saw another face of Armenia a face that was not like very compatible with what my grandparents used to tell me about. And uh, since I was working in women's issues in Canada before, I did my studies in, in comparative literature and feminist uh, Armenian literature, uh, and I was involved in women's centers in Montreal. Um, for me, it was very important to see how the conditions of uh, women were in Armenia. So in my spare time, I used to go drink coffee with women in the villages and ask them questions on different issues about their life in the family, about their health issues, uh, reproductive health, etc. So I gained a lot of information through this experience. And the second year I came back, well, I came back that summer, it was for one month and a half, and we had a baby and we didn't came back that same same summer and we came back a year later and I said I want to try Armenia with a one-year-old to see if I can survive Armenia with kids uh, so I, I took my baby who was one year old at that time and we stayed that uh, the second time in Shushi uh, again with uh, the same organization Land and Culture and uh, we volunteered uh, in renovating one part of the hospital in Shushi and again, it was another experience because this time it was not a village, but more um, a town, a city where people were coming from different uh, paths, um, refugees, IDPs, local Armenians, talking a lot about the war because Shushi is a little bit very um, different compared to other towns in Garapal and in Armenia because you can see directly the war and the post effects also in people. Um, and, and, and I was in touch again, I did the same thing, going into families, drinking coffee, talking to the woman, uh, visiting the hospital and other organizations. Getting a lot of background yeah. information. Yeah. <laughs> and also trying to find a way with how to see, to see myself if, if I would be able to live here with my kids. So um, the Women's Resource Center was founded in Yerevan in 2003. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, its functions, the, the role that it serves in, in, in society and some of the projects that you work on? Mm -hmm. Um, after all this experience, when we decided to move to Armenia, I said I can move only on one condition if I'm going to work on women's issues because I cannot my, see myself as a woman living in this society with how the they, way things are. Yeah, the, the way things are. So I got in touch with, um, uh, with the university first year because I didn't know who to call. Uh, and they put me in contact with uh, the co founder now uh, of the organization, Gohar Shah Nazarian, which is a uh, professor in sociology and through email exchanges we developed a program for women's uh, women center pro, uh, project uh, which suited more what my expectations were and her expectations at the same time and her knowing her more the reality of Armenian women in Armenia and this was something that didn't exist 
No, it, it was like a drop-in center never existed in um, neither in Soviet Armenia nor post-Soviet Armenia. And it was a new concept and because NGOs usually in Armenia work very in like very traditional ways where you have like it's like a business run or mm. very institutional. And we wanted really a place where women can drop and drop in and exchange and live in it and you know and being part participate in, in the project. So in two, summer of 2003, I came here uh, after discussing all this, and we started with Gohar together at the university to uh, gather young women, young students, professors who were interested in this issue a little bit, and they, they want to know more about it. And we cr created a um, program for women's human rights where a lot of women can come and gain information, participate in a training, and to know the basic uh, info on uh, women's rights in general and how the reality is in Armenia, about the different conventions that Armenia signed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of women gathered at that time, at that, that summer 2003, and we worked a lot. And in, in, the, uh, in the fall, we asked uh, at the, to the Department of Sociology to give us a small space. It took them one year, actually, almost, to give, them, to give us a space. So we used to gather like in different my house, uh, Gohar's house, in cafes a little bit because we didn't have space, we didn't have money, nothing to to rent a place. And then afterwards they give us a s small room uh, and the main building, uh, library building, and we started there working more actively and my, our main um, objective was to gather as much as possible young women and discuss together what 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 was the things that were bothering them specifically in this Ar in the Armenian society uh, because of them being women or girls, and uh, from there we uh, the whole project developed even further, and we knew at that time that uh, basically what we want to work on, mm -hmm. um, giving information, raising awareness, changing stereotypes. So right now the, the, the projects that, that are focused on, I know that there's a hotline, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of awareness and education activities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the center is open as, as a drop-in uh, location for, for um, battered women to, to come in for, for assistance? For all women it's open because we don't, we, we just, we don't work just with battered women, we, we work with young women and women who have different difficulties in life or just, just want to share things and they need a safe space to talk to other women. So the drop-in, it's open to all women. Uh, we have a hotline, we specifically work on sexual violence, uh, but we get a lot of calls of domestic violence, but, and we work with them as well at the same time. But the awareness that we do, we base a lot on uh, gender-based violence, sexual violence, harassment at work, in the educational centers, because our um, membership is mostly young women, mostly university students, and these are the issues that they raise mm -hmm. uh, and since there's no other hotline for sexual violence we thought it was important to have that. Now uh, issues like uh, sexual violence, um, domestic violence, mm -hmm. these are crimes. Mm -hmm. um, Armenia doesn't have specific legislation that criminalizes domestic violence mm -hmm. uh, as a separate category of assault. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what are your thoughts about that and what has been some of the government or police uh, reaction to some of the work that you do because you're dealing with 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 crimes that are happening. Mm -hmm. Well, for sexual violence, we have the law. It's very lenient. We worked on the amendments. Now we finished the amendments and we present it to Parliament, and it will be put on vote for up to June. But what's related to domestic violence? We're the only country in the region, South Caucasus, that we don't have one. We have one pending uh, law, but. Uh, it's not going through government, it's not going through parliament, because there's this traditional, uh, can, um, very, um, well, we live in a very patriarchal society and we know that most of our representatives in parliament are men, we don't have a lot of women uh, present there, and uh, the, um, there's no genuine willingness to pass this kind of law because there's this, um, uh, understanding that this is not something that's happening in mm -hmm. Armenia, that this is created maybe, or it's not as much as important to... Or it's and a family matter. Yes, and, and, and the government thinks that if the, the law passes, then it means that they're acknowledging it as a problem, and they're not ready to do that. 
But now they don't have a choice. They're at the point where, because of foreign pressures, and activism. And activism. <laughs> activism, it has been a long time that there has been activism. This past years it was more active, but also uh, because they also, um, Armenia needs to uh, go with international conventions, right. so they don't have a choice in a way. So it help, it's helping us and we're using that tool very um, often. Um, and because of some of cases that past year were very mediatized, so we have data that we can show government. And now NGOs are have more capacity, and they are more involved in uh, governmental institutions. So they they have more means of lobbying and advocating for such a law. So is the law going to change mindsets, or are the mindsets going to have to change before the law change? <laughs> I think both should work together at the same time, yeah, the same time because uh, if we pass the law today, it doesn't mean that uh, violence will end. There's a lot to do, too. but at least it will give us a proof that it's acknowledged by the government, Armenia condemns it, and also we will have resources allocated to counter that. Because now if we, we, we work as NGOs, our work initially should be on advocating, lobbying for changes, for policies, for monitoring the government and other things. But now we, we are more stuck in service providing. Uh, kind of filling in the role yes, that the government, the government should, should partly from do. Things that should come from national from the national budget but it's not al allocated right now but once the law passes then we will have more resources national re resources to counter that um okay how do you see the relation between uh women's uh conventional roles as caretakers mothers uh, matriarch figures with um professional careers higher education politics um in armenia today mm. Well, there's a lot of obstacles for women to be involved in public office or public life because uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union, even though the Soviet Union were trying to put things or on more on an equal base, very on an inst institutional level, but at least women had the opportunity to be more in the public uh, sphere. But after the collapse of Soviet Union, we we lost. Uh, that part and we're going backwards, we're not advancing and we're, we're back to uh, this national um, mentality of um, which is, I don't think it's Ar Armenian so because they, they well, when they talk about it they say you know it's the Armenian mentality or the Armenian tradition that women should be a caretaker, should be a mother, a housewife. You don't something. believe that that's a part I, of I don't, tradition? I, I don't believe it's part of our tradition. I think because we live in a patriarchal society and uh, the, the power is, uh, women don't have the power and they, they are still um, confined uh, by the ruling power the, to those kind of uh, roles, so they don't get the power themselves. So it's very difficult to combine that uh, in this actual society because we don't have role models or success stories very visible. Uh, a lot of young women, when you go uh, do interviews in universities, they, they don't have examples. Mm -hmm. they, they just have examples of their mothers, grandmothers, who sacrificed their lives, stayed home, take took take took care of the So family. they need powerful uh, role models that, that that are visibly successful and and uh, able to be you know, modeled that. Yes, and for our generation, is maybe the most difficult because we need to create those models. We need to empower them. We need to find those young women who are very much active and push them forward or create the space so they would be uh, they had they they would have self confidence enough self confidence to say that they are able because the whole society will. Um, will keep them back. You know? mm -hmm. How does uh, how does pop culture today in Armenia fit into this? Um, oh the, the, the the pop culture that's created here locally, and also like you know, I see Armenia kind of as a sponge where where it absorbs um, things from the United States, things from Russia, etc. Uh, in trying to I guess um, fit in. So how how, how do those fit into um, into uh, gender stereotypes and influences? It's horrible. Pop culture is horrible, and it's it's copy paste culture, and it's very bad, badly copy paste. You know, like things that Russia does, uh, they copy paste a lot because Russia is the you know for them it's the role model for pop culture, and a lot of things are 
if you watch TV, if you look through video clips and everything, it's all like strengthening yeah. the oldest the soap operas. And soap operas are horrible because you can't watch a soap opera where you don't see violence constantly, not only against women, against everyone, uh, and also showing uh, oligarchs as like role models. And this is how like when you watch TV, you should, you know, this is what you want to be in the future, rich. They're the ones that are successful, they're the ones that it's are driving nice cars. It's, yeah. it does, it's not on our side and, <laughs> and it's very difficult to counter that, specifically in the regions. In, in Yerevan, you can still find alternative things, but in the regions, it's awful. It's worse? It's worse because they don't have other means of especially the youth are confined in homes a lot of times and it's the TV this is the their all their only um, way of entertaining themselves so whatever they watch on TV or sometimes on the internet it's what's given to them and there's a lot of activism also against that against um, bad TV bad TV yeah. bad culture the music everything I guess it goes back to, to, to needing uh, more positive role models yes. and, and, and examples. Yes. Um, last year, um, after the, the murder of uh, Zaru Petrosyan, the 20-year-old um, young lady that was tragically murdered, mm -hmm. um, there was sort of worldwide uh, outrage and condemnation, and uh, it seemed to, to shake the foundation of um, the taboo topic of domestic violence, um, uh, both here in Armenia and also in the diaspora. Um, uh, I remember the Armenian Youth Federation organized the March in LA, that was the first of its kind, that, that drew over 200 people um, in sh sort of showing the solidarity um, that said that this is an issue that affects not, not only Armenians in Armenia, but Armenians everywhere, and um, uh, what steps can, can di diaspora organizations take along with activists in Armenia to, to further bring awareness and to, to, to bring change to this issue? Well, actually, Zari's example was a very uh, good example of diaspora and Armenia cooperation in maybe I, I would see first social issue because I don't see any other, for me, I, it's not clear any other cooperation either in an environment issue or political or anything else. Uh, the first thing that, well, it, uh, also for the Zaruri case, it was very visible that it was the new generation who were involved, even in the diaspora. Uh, I didn't see any, uh, even though we tried a lot, like the, one of the older organizations, institutional, um, like for example, if we, we, we look at the ARS uh, home, uh, we were expecting that they would back us up a lot also, since they are the ones who are uh, mostly um, involved in women's issues. But the thing is that most of the older organizations in the diaspora are very much cut into the relief psychology, you know. When they talk about um, Armenia, it's mostly like help out the poor or the less adv advantage uh, and uh, we need we need to get out as diasporans we need to get out of that mentality you know armenia does not need relief armenia has a lot of <laughs> rich people who can do that <laughs> in armenia we need to bring in from the diaspora an experience that we learned all, since our birth it's activism because we do a lot of activism in the diaspora we learn that our mothers our fathers they're always uh, involved in um, in the, the Armenian clubs doing like I remember when I was a kid my parents were almost never home because they were they had this job that job because they they had this uh, drive to uh, change things for them sort of built them. yes and this is something that we are very well uh, we have a lot of experience on that and this is something that we should bring so how do we connect in Armenia we connected when we start seeing Armenia as a as an equal partner in that okay. And also we connected as when we try to um, voice our concerns in Armenia, not only um, regarding, uh, how can I say, um, diaspora issues, but also local Armenian right. issues. Because the Armenian who is living in, Arme in Armenia right now has so many issues that they need to, to settle. Uh, while the diaspora is mainly, uh, 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 how do you say it, um, not, I don't want to say interested, but for them, there's the genocide issue, which is very important, but it seems that 
all their energy is concentrated on that. There's a lot more in Armenia that needs to be uh, discussed. For example, environmental issues, uh, co um, corruption issues, governmental issues. But it, it, it seems that Armen uh, diasporans, they are a little bit afraid to tackle that because they don't want to be bad with the government. They don't want to intrude in the... Uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think that there might be an education factor because uh, um, you don't feel that on, on, on your skin necessarily. It's not something that you're, that you're growing up uh, talking about. Um, so I think that um, there might be some, some educational foundation that would mm -hmm. probably help with that. And also maybe uh, coming and living in Armenia for a while as a young person, because that, that would help me to, right. to see things. Because before coming to Armenia and living here, not as a tourist, but as like volunteer or working here, the only uh, example of Armenia I had, description of Armenia, was like this you know, this heavenly place that my grandparents would used to talk, that the school in, in the diaspora talks about, that the clubs in the diaspora talks about, this like the place that is perfect and which has no problems at all. You know, everything is good, all people are good, there are no problems. So when you come to Armenia and you live here as a volunteer first, then as permanent living here, then you you have you, you are in a culture shock, then you, you get depressed, you're like, <laughs> you know, this is like it's a trauma that you live because this is not what you expected, you know. And you see uh, prostitute, you see corruption, you see people uh, stealing from you, and it's the end of the world, you know, because this is not what you were prepared for. So you. But I the goal is to not be hopeless about that. Yes, uh, uh, feeling powerful. Yeah, because you you need to come here for a while, uh, live a little bit. Uh, and the honeymoon stage and start a real love, you know, because well said, well said. after that. <laughs> okay, last question. Um, in an ideal Armenia, how do you see the women's role in, in society? First of all, I would see it more in a decision field, uh, taking decisions in a public sphere, uh, not having to decide uh, which one to sacrifice, family or uh, social life or uh, career. Uh, I would I I would want to see that those uh, that Armenian women would be able to choose for themselves and not let society or parents or uh, friends or husbands or I don't know girlfriends uh, let them or decide for themselves. And now we don't have the society where women can choose for themselves. If they want to be housewives, they need to choose by themselves to be housewives. If they want to be politicians, they need to choose. But they don't have equal opportunity on that. To have the opportunities and to, to have the, the choice to, to make those opportunities yes, happen. Awesome. Diverse choice. Not but, um, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.